all month long, we have been uh, talking about, uh, when I say all month, I mean last week, we talked about folks uh, who, in spite of their circumstance, wind up choosing joy. And what we can learn because of that. And we talked about last week how even though it took Naomi a little while to get there to choose joy, that didn't sway God's love for her. That didn't sway God's blessing for her. And so it grants us the freedom to, well, <laughs> uh, get the point maybe later on. <laughs> and today, I want to talk to you about a very unique place in Scripture. What we're about to read is a psalm, a song, and a lawsuit all wrapped up in one. And it's coming from the perspective of a man who's been through a lot and knows that there's an even longer road yet to tow. He's in charge of leading a nation who is quick to forget, is not appreciative as they should be, and often would rather choose their own way. I want to take you here to Deuteronomy 32, verses 1 through 4. And we're going to read here the beginning of what is called the Song of Moses. Reading from Deuteronomy 32. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. And let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching drop as the rain, my, gentle, my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass and like showers upon the herb. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock, his work, is perfect for all his ways are justice and a God, excuse me, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. I want to talk to you today about a joyous shout. But before we do so, I want to invite you to please pray with me. Father, I come before you, a servant to your call. May you speak through me in spite of me. And let us do justice to your word this morning. Amen. How many of you knows what it feels like to feel angry and happy at the exact same time? kind of a tough spot to think about, right? And when seen in real life, it can kind of look a little silly. And so I have a demonstration for you this morning of what being maybe, we're going to try to drum it up as best as we could, uh, what being angry and talking about something inherently good or nice might look like. I want to invite Landon forward this morning. I tagged him before we started service and yet told him nothing about what we are about to do. And uh, I want to invite you, we're going to stand right here. You even get your own mic today. Because it's really, it's really important. Here, try that out. Okay, there we go. So it's really important that these folks hear you. And, and this is sort of your, your debut of acting this morning, because I'm going to ask something pretty peculiar from you, okay? We're trying, to, we're, trying, we're trying to let them know what being internally upset looks like while talking about something awesome, okay? So... You gotta get in the right mindset for this, because normally you're pretty, I mean, at least around me, you're a pretty chipper dude. So I, I want you to think about stuff that might make you pretty upset. 
probably the reality that the Eagles are going to lose like 12 games this season. And you're going to watch Kenny Pickett be your quarterback because Jalen Hurts is probably going to like go on vacation or something with his oodles of money and just take some time off. And you're going to have to watch Kenny Pickett play, the former Steeler, play as the Eagle quarterback all year this year. I think, I mean, I root for a far superior team. So I, I, that wouldn't make me upset. But it probably, probably gets your feathers a little ruffled. Yeah. All right? So, yeah, feel that inside of you. Yeah, yeah, channel it, channel it. Now, as angrily as you can say, say the word bubbles. Bubbles! <laughs> I think you, you can do a little bit better than that. Bubbles! Keep going. Bubbles! Angry! Bubbles! Angry! Bubbles! Did I tell you to stop? Keep going! Bubbles! Keep going! Bubbles! You're not angry enough! Bubbles. Feel it in your soul! Bubbles! <laughs> Alright. <laughs> Give him a hand. Give him a hand. All right. So it looks kind of funny when on the inside we're angry, and yet on the outside we're talking about something pretty nice. Um, this is where Moses finds himself. This is actually a beginning of a lawsuit between Moses and God. He is going to sort of remind God that, hey, although we stink right now, uh, you said that you love us and you're not going to forsake us or leave us. And so no matter how bad it is right now, you're on our side. And yet, as a leader of Israel, he's incredibly frustrated. He wants to correct and reprove, and he's angry at his circumstances. He's angry that God is angry. He's angry that his folks don't understand and are quick to forget. And yet, God is good. He's worthy of our praise. And so we're met with this joyous shout, I love you, God, in Deuteronomy 32. We got to roll out the red carpet before I get to why we're studying this passage today. Today we're going to take away two things that make God such a great rock. But he does talk about a couple things before he gets there. So I want to lay the framework for you a little bit. Take a look here. Moses begins his song in a spirit of correction. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and let the earth hear the words out of my mouth. It is this, this call that... All of creation needs to get in on what this conversation is going to be about. Later on in this chapter, is going to be talking about how, okay, we are your people, and you said you're going to love us, and I know that we're way off right now, but please stay faithful. But, and it's this back and forth conversation, but it's written as a song and a psalm because God is awesome and he deserves to be praised. And so, he wants everybody in on the conversation. Verse 1 is all about, I hope you hear and I hope you comprehend what I'm about to say. And then he sort of turns his attention to those who've done him wrong in the nation of Israel. Here, may my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, like gentle rain upon the tender grass and like showers upon the herb. This is rolling out the carpet from Moses that says, I'm going to teach you a thing or two. 
And I hope like a crop thirsting for water, you take it. May it be refreshing for your soul. In my life right now, I'm faced with a lot of situations of correction. How many of you find yourself in the season where right now you're just sort of correcting folks and putting them back on the right path? I know parents, particularly with younger children getting ready to go back to school, we're shaking off our bad summer habits and we're getting ready to go back to the classroom. Hey, don't interrupt. Be nice. Don't run. Getting kids sort of prepped to go back to school. Best behaved. Moses feels like a parent gently correcting a child and he wants them to absorb this sound advice that's going to come. And he's upset and he's frustrated that he's in this position. And yet as a leader, he's faithful to who he's called to be. But Moses does something here that I hope you take away today as a key lesson. Just because Moses has a lot to complain about, that doesn't make it his core identity. Now, he's going to have a, a lot of things to reprove and to correct as the leader of God's people. And yet, the thing that always remains the most important thing for Moses is... I love you, Lord. You are good. And I will ascribe to who you are today. How many of you have a fair share to complain about right now? I do. I do. It's August. You'd think the grass would stop growing by now. <laughs> I'm real petty like that. I was angry in the beginning of the week because NASCAR took two weeks off. And now, this week, when they're back in Richmond, now Richmond's going to get hit by a hurricane, and I have to wait longer to watch cars go around in circles for a couple hours. I get angry and upset at the most stupid stuff. And I'm sure if we're honest with ourselves in the grand scheme of things, we might get upset and angry about silly, insignificant things as well. Not Moses. Moses is upset at souls being lost. Moses is upset at an entire people group ignoring a God who is good. He's actually got things to be upset about. And so if there's anybody in this room that is supposed to make that kind of their shtick, it's Moses. And yet, he doesn't. Chapter 32 of Deuteronomy is not just one guy complaining about how bad things are. It's a song. It's a song. Because although I am angry, God is still good. So there are two things here, two, two takeaways I want to give you as we've sufficiently rolled out the red carpet long enough. Very quick takeaways of what makes God a wonderful rock. Let's read the verse again. Verse 3 is the change in tone. I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, 
a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. God's still good all the time, no matter how I feel. First, our first takeaway of why God is a good rock is that his work is always perfect. Take a look here. Moses is very quick to proclaim his work is perfect. In verse 4, why? Well, at this point, Moses has lived a very long life. One filled with more ups and downs than most of us combined. Trials and tribulations unforeseen in any age before him. And yet, in God's perfect timing, things sort of just work out. How many of you have that same conclusion about our Lord? I may not understand him, but he's perfect. He's everything I ever need. I've had this terrible sin problem that kept me far away from God. You know what? He fixed that. I feel alone and destitute. Guess what? It's right in the name. God with us. I feel low and unseen. Well, I got news for you. He knew you before you were even in your mother's womb. He's perfect. Everything you would ever need. Moses reaches that same conclusion and he's very bold in proclaiming it because it's so simple. His work is perfect. How many of you, when your world is falling apart, shout to the heavens, God, you are perfect. Almost looks as absurd as shouting bubbles. Because not many people do that. What do we go to God and talk about when life is falling apart? How crummy our life is. How he's not acting quick enough. What he's not doing on our time. How much we yearn for life to be different. And yet, our prayers and our supplications are not exalting the goodness of our God. Which never changes. Moses sets up a great blueprint for those who are suffering. Make sure you give God his due. Yeah, there's a lot of work left to to be found in this chapter. Moses has got a lot to say to Israel, and he's going to claim before God that we're falling apart right now, but I hope that you love us, and I know that you are faithful. But before all that, God, you're perfect. And I might not feel that right now, but just because I feel it doesn't mean it's not true. Why is he perfect? Because his ways are just. They're free. They're out of the bind that they're in. Sure, life doesn't look exactly how they would have thought, but... Up until this point, God has pretty much been exactly who he said he is. The bad guys always lose, and the good guys are always vindicated. They're always redeemed. They're always restored. He's just. How many of you know that's true, but sometimes don't feel it? If you doubt, we can go back after church, flick on the news for a little bit. Now I'll ask you, in a world that seems to fall apart, do you know that God is just? Of course you do. How often do we proclaim it? So we learn that he's perfect, and he's perfect because he's just. Our second takeaway of why this rock is so good 
is that not only is he perfect because he's just, but he is always faithful and there is no injustice found in him. You want a solid place to be? You want a firm foundation on something that never changes? I got news for you. What makes this rock oh so good is that he is always faithful. And he will never leave you hanging. It's a tough truth to proclaim. But even in the darkest of circumstances, it's worth shouting. Lord, you are perfect because you are just and you are faithful because I know you will never leave me or forsake me. Moses had a very clear opportunity to make this psalm all about him. To make this song about how terrible and awful life truly is. Yeah, they've come a long way, but things are sort of falling apart right now. So he's got no time to dwell on the good stuff. Let's just talk about, God, how you haven't been knitting this family close together like I thought you would. But what does he do? He says, Israel, I'll get to you in a second. And I hope you hear me out. But God, you are perfect. You are my rock. And I will always come to you because there are some things that never change about you. You never leave me astray. You are always faithful. And you are always just. You see, friends, Moses' joyful shout is with clenched teeth and a mouth of frustration. Why don't they understand it now? Why hasn't God fixed our issues now? We've been through so much together. Why are they quick to forget? And we have fallen so far away. I think we might be pushing God to the limit here. So I gotta go and talk to him. And by the way, God, there's a lot going on right now. Yet, I love you. Who do you know in your life that's making their circumstances their identity and they lose focus on just how good the rock really is? Gas is so expensive. Food costs too much. Can't afford a place to live. I got trouble at work. I got trouble at home. I got trouble at church. You know, I was really hoping he'd pick a different Bible study. Oh, you're telling me fall's coming around the corner? Oh, there's so many family reunions and things to prepare for. My schedule is too overloaded. I don't have enough time for my friends and my family. I just need time and space to breathe. How many people do you know that's all you hear from them? And you know they're the Lord. But that's not the first thing out of that. Moses gives us a great blueprint. Joyfully shout. Even if you got to do it with clenched teeth. 
God, you are still good, even in spite of what's going on. And I'm going to put the most important thing first. Let the goodness of the rock be the first thing you talk. Let the goodness of the gospel be the first words out of your lips. Don't fall into the trap that the world would have you in, in plunging your identity into the problems of the world. You will never have enough time to talk about them all. But I can tell you this. Moses said a lot in two verses. The rock is perfect. His ways are just. He is always faithful. He is without blemish. And he is always upright with me. Surely, we can start our conversations with those declarations of how good our Lord is in spite of our circumstances. Who are you going to joyfully shout in front of today that my God, my rock, is worth my praise? This is God's word for God's people. Amen.